Salacious History discusses sex, romance, and many other topics that are intended for a mature audience. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Salacious History, the podcast that explores moments in history that were shaped by sex, romance, and people who were generally down to clown. I'm your host, Sarah Duncan. Welcome back, everyone. I'm so excited to be kicking off season two of Salacious History. This season, I'll be releasing 10 new episodes full of saucy, suggestive, scandalous true stories dating all the way back to the first century B.C., 10 episodes not enough for you? Sign up to support Salacious History on Patreon.com and you'll get exclusive access to three bonus episodes every season. Our bonus episodes from season one cover topics including feminism and pornography, the state of Missouri v. Celia, a slave girl, and the true stories of two murdered mail order brides. Again, head over to Patreon.com slash Salacious History and sign up to support the show and listen to exclusive bonus episodes. One of our most popular episodes from season one was Sex and Marriage, the Tudor period. In that episode, we discussed how royal marriages were more often arranged based on political alliances than love, and that the church had significant influence over the marital status and sex lives of their flock. One family where these two factors converged was Henry VIII and his six wives. You probably heard this rhyme about the fate of his wives back in school. Divorced, beheaded, died. Divorced, beheaded, survived. There is enough information available around this royal melodrama that it could honestly be an entire podcast unto itself. So I'll tell you up front that I left out many details in the name of streamlining the overall narrative. Even so, this will still be a two-parter. Part one will introduce us to King Henry VIII and his first two wives, Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn. So grab your goblet of wine and try not to lose your head. Here we go. King Henry VIII ruled England for 36 years. He is perhaps most famous for ushering in the English Reformation and marrying a series of six wives in his quest for political alliance, romance, and a healthy male heir. But before we get into all that, let's go back to the beginning. Henry was born on June 28, 1491. He was the second son of Henry VII, the first English ruler from the House of Tudor. His older brother Arthur was in line to inherit the throne, So Henry spent his youth preparing for a career in the church. His broad education covered theology, music, languages, poetry, and sports. But Henry's entire life was turned on its head when his older brother Arthur died suddenly in 1502. Henry was just 10 years old when his brother died, and he now found himself next in line for the crown. Despite this dramatic change in his life's trajectory, Henry spent the next seven years in calm expectation of the crown. This gave him time to develop the self-assuredness and the sense of righteousness he needed to ascend the throne of confidence. Henry would ascend the throne of England in 1509 at the age of 17. Six feet tall, handsome, and powerfully built, great things were expected of Henry VIII after the long winter of his father's reign. Henry's first marriage was to the Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon. Catherine was born on December 16, 1485. Coincidentally, the year of her birth was the same year that Henry VII established the Tudor dynasty. Catherine was the youngest child of Spanish royals Ferdinand of Aragon and Isabella of Castile. Her parents were living legends throughout Europe. Their marriage had united the Kingdom of Spain and they had driven the Moors out of Granada. The two of them were known as the Catholic Monarchs. 
Catherine's mother was a devout woman and was also very intelligent. All of the children, even the daughters, received an excellent education. At age three, Catherine was betrothed to Henry VII's infant son, Prince Arthur. The King of England knew that marriage with the Spanish princess would help to validate the new Tudor dynasty and bring stability to the region. Catherine, accompanied by a vast dowry, sailed to England in 1501, just short of her 16th birthday. Catherine and Prince Arthur were married a few weeks after her arrival. Their wedding was a glorious celebration, and all of London rejoiced and anticipated a great future for the young newlyweds. Less than six months after their wedding, Arthur died from the dreaded sweating sickness. I had never heard of sweating sickness, so I did a little research. Sweating sickness, also called English sweat, is a disease that appeared in England as an epidemic on five occasions between 1485 and 1551. It was almost entirely confined to England, except for one outbreak where it spread to other parts of the European continent. These outbreaks were severe and came with a very high mortality rate. Symptoms would begin with shivering, headaches, giddiness, and severe weakness. After one to three hours, the patient would become drenched in sweat and experience a rapid pulse and deliriousness. Death could occur within 18 hours after the first symptoms appeared. If the patient survived the first 24 hours, recovery from the illness was much more likely. To this day, medical professionals have no idea what caused these outbreaks of sweating sickness. Needless to say, the royal family was devastated by this loss. Surprisingly, Catherine was not sent home to Spain. Shortly after Arthur's death, Henry VII wrote to the King and Queen of Spain about another marriage proposal for Catherine. Some historians speculate that Henry VII was so eager to arrange a new proposal for Catherine because of his legendary greediness. Catherine had brought half of her dowry with her at the time she married Arthur. If she returned to Spain, her marriage contract required that her dowry be returned. Additionally, her inheritance as Dowager Princess of Wales was nothing to scoff at. If Catherine left England, so would that source of income. After some negotiations, Catherine was engaged to Arthur's younger son, Henry VIII. In order for the future marriage to be permitted, Henry VII sought a papal dispensation, or special permission, from Pope Julius II. Catherine and her duenna, Donna Elvira, both wrote accounts stating that Catherine and Arthur never consummated their marriage. With this knowledge, the Pope granted the dispensation and allowed the engagement to go forward. At the time of her second engagement, Catherine wrote to her father that she had no desire to remain in England, but she obeyed his wishes nonetheless. It's possible that she knew enough about Henry VII's character to know that she would be neglected by her future father-in-law. Despite her position as a royal, she basically lived in poverty in the years following Arthur's death. The Spanish ambassador provided her basic necessities, and she was unable to pay her attendance. Henry VIII became King of England in 1509 at the age of 17, and he and Catherine were married shortly thereafter. Though Catherine was six years older than her new husband, the pair seemed to be a good match. Catherine and Henry spent many happy years together. They were described as being a loving and affectionate couple, which was not always a given for royal marriages. They showed public displays of affection as well as mutual love and respect for each other. Queen Catherine was quite popular among her English subjects. She served as regent when Henry was abroad and even oversaw a battle with the Scots while Henry was waging war in France. Henry was an active king in the early years of his monarchy. He kept a notoriously festive and lavish court, hunted, jousted, wrote and played music, and even wrote a book-length attack on Martin Luther's church reforms. Ironically, this written attack earned Henry VIII the title of Defender of the Faith from Pope Leo X. The one thing that ate away at the king over the years was the desire for a legitimate male heir something that seemed more and more elusive as time went on. 
Catherine was very aware of her duty to bear children, as many as possible and preferably sons. Henry VIII was the only surviving son of his father, so producing a male heir was of the utmost importance. Catherine was by no means barren, and she and Henry did their best to produce a large family. Sources vary as to how many children Catherine of Aragon carried. Some historians suggest she was pregnant six times, while others say it may have been as many as ten times. The truth is likely somewhere in the middle. According to Tudor scholar J.J. Scarisbrick, Catherine had, quote, several miscarriages, three infants who were either stillborn or died immediately after birth, two of them males, and two infants who died within a few weeks of birth, unquote. Their marriage produced just one living child, a daughter named Mary. Henry was not unhappy when Mary was born. He felt sure that the birth of a healthy son was sure to follow the birth of his daughter. Sadly, Henry's prediction proved to be wrong, and a surviving male heir never came. England had had a female monarch before, but Henry and his contemporaries did not relish the thought of female succession, with all the political and dynastic uncertainties it would bring. I find this extremely ironic, considering all the political unrest and issues of inheritance that came out of Henry's future romantic endeavors. Dude, just stop while you're ahead. Let the women lead. Catherine's last recorded pregnancy was in 1516, when she was 33 years old. Being the type of man he was, Henry could never imagine that the problem may be him, especially after he fathered an illegitimate son with one of his mistresses. For Henry, this proved that he was capable of producing sons, but the queen was not. By 1527, over 10 years after Catherine's last pregnancy, Henry's desperation for a legitimate male heir was building as he was rapidly losing favor with his people. A series of unpopular or ineffective policies had exacerbated men of influence while also failing to bring satisfaction to the poorer citizens of England. Henry was failing to live up to the great things that were expected of him. As this desperation was building, he met a captivating young woman named Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn's exact birth date is unknown. Even the year is widely debated. Most historians support the argument that she was born in 1501 or 1502, though a strong argument also exists for her being born as late as 1507. Her father was Sir Thomas Boleyn, a minor courtier with great ambition to advance his status. In 1514, Henry VIII sent his youngest sister, Princess Mary, to France to marry the aged King of France. A young Anne Boleyn accompanied the princess as a lady-in-waiting. Anne remained in France for several years, even after the French king died and Mary Tudor returned to England. Anne spent her years in France being educated at court, developing her skills in the areas of fashion, flirtation, music, singing, and dancing. These skills would later serve her well at the English court. Anne returned to England in late 1521 or early 1522 due to the growing tensions between England and France. Anne's early years at the English court were actually spent in service to Catherine of Aragon. She became quite popular among the young men of the court, though sources indicate that Anne Boleyn was not considered a great beauty. Historical chroniclers had described her as, quote, plain, sallow, and possessing two distinct flaws, a large mole on the side of her neck and an extra finger on her left hand, unquote. Okay, Dix, let's take the criticism down a few notches, okay? She did, however, have beautiful dark eyes and long black hair. Anne was high-spirited and quick-tempered, and largely won over men with her style, wit, and sexual magnetism. In 